Chapter 1. Poverty has a huge impact on individuals, families, and communities. Sarah Smarsh's grandmother, Betty, gave birth to her mother, Jeannie, at the age of 16. Her biological grandfather was a Wichita thug who consistently abused and almost murdered Betty. This made her leave Wichita when Jeannie was just a few months old, and they kept moving among urban areas in the middle of the country, Wichita, Chicago, Denver, Dallas, and neighboring towns. When Jeannie started high school, they had changed addresses 48 times. Moving around was the common lifestyle of many young single mothers and their daughters and her family. They mostly worked several jobs and moved about to escape men to get the chance to do something better. If you are wild enough to enjoy it, poverty can contain a sort of freedom. No careers or properties to maintain. No community meetings or social status to be responsible to. Sarah Smarsh. Betty met Arnie, a farmer who owned about 160 acres of farmland. Betty had been divorced six times, but Arnie loved and treated her better than she'd ever been treated. Betty moved with her daughter to Arnie's farm, and after a few months, they got married. Teenage Jeannie met Nick Smarsh on Arnie's farm, a farmer and carpenter and friend of Arnie's firstborn. Because Jeannie came from a long line of women who worked harder than the men, she respected Nick, who was different from the men she was used to. He worked really hard. They got engaged, and Jeannie became pregnant at 17. After they got married in 1980, Sarah Smarsh was born, making Betty a grandma at 34. As a kid, Smarsh heard lots of don'ts. Don't speak, don't laugh, don't cry. The price of her existence was made known, and her actions either did or didn't justify it. It was an age-long cycle that existed in her family that Smarsh was determined to break. Smarsh's family had enough to eat and a roof over their heads, but the poverty she felt the most was the scarcity of her mother's heart, which the traumas of monetary poverty had scarred. She was emotionally impoverished and had a constant longing, longing, longing for, for a mother who was nearby yet so far. More than wanting her mother's affection, Smarsh wanted her to be genuinely happy. The agony of a poor child is just as often for her parents as it is for herself. For a child to survive, her parents must survive as well. This summary explains how one can be financially okay and still not have it all, amidst other things. Chapter 2 The American Dream has a huge price that varies with the level of poverty. Smarsh's parents had creative ways of making a fast dollar. When the sale of high-powered fireworks was banned in their area, her family built a fireworks stand close to Cheney Lake, which was far from their home, where people spend the weekend. They opened a business and sold heaps of fireworks, making lots of money. Smarsh was raised to work hard so that the family had a roof and enough to eat. The American class system has been denied for centuries. The United States convinced itself, while Smarsh was growing up, that it didn't exist. It was not discussed or understood, and the country ignores families like Smarsh's. People usually believe that a system of hard work and know-how is the way to succeed, but the American dream has a price tag on it. The poorer you are, the higher the price. The cost depends on your place of birth, your parents, how much they own, own, and the color of your skin. Skin. You can pay the price your entire life, life and have nothing to show for it except debt and abject poverty. For a long time, more people fell down the ladder rather than climbed it. Becoming successful is more costly if your family is poor because you will have less money and available opportunities. While Smarsh's family had enough to eat and a roof to live under, they knew what it felt like to need something essential and go without it because they lacked the money. Chapter 3 Poverty makes motherhood harder, and motherhood makes poverty harder. People are born into hard labor because of poverty. What puts laborers in their roles is birth and family history, not the lack of talent for something else. Single mothers and their children are the poorest types of families in the United States. Smarsh's mother, Jeannie, felt the frustration that comes with the female gender coupled with poverty. Daily circumstances constantly beat her down. She hated her life, and the children that came into it felt it. Nick, Smarsh's father, was different. He had a quiet inner life which he shared with her once in a while. He taught her how to quiet her mind and treated her with respect, no matter how hard his day was. Children from low-income families face constant physical dangers. Smarsh's mother and grandmother faced more physical dangers and poverty while growing up. Smarsh's childhood had neglect included, as parents were too busy working or drunk to look after her. Smarsh's childhood coincided with the time health insurance was privatized. Poor and working-class women had less access to quality health care due to lack of money and distrust of medical professionals who rarely believed the pain they reported. The mortality rate for poor, rural women has risen greatly over Smarsh's lifetime. Living a life that lacks proper care affects the body and brain, resulting in chronic stress. Smarsh lived in a constant state of stress but couldn't even notice it. She felt the stress of her poverty-scarred mother first. Although living in a place where women's bodies were vulnerable due to poverty and being female, she was fortunate enough to have a kind father who loved her deeply. She had safety within her own family, which might be the reason she escaped some family cycles such as teenage pregnancy, addiction, and lack of a college degree. Chapter 4 Frustration of rural life is mostly about opportunity. In 1970, land prices rose, and banks granted farm mortgages, using a farm's productivity as collateral. When land prices fell during Smarsh's 1980s childhood, the collateral value fell, interest rates spiked, and banks foreclosed on farms. 
People experienced the farm crisis when stores, restaurants, etc. were closing and people moved to cities. Smarsh's paternal grandmother, Teresa, who had a soft spot for her and an interest in her education, wanted her to leave farming behind and move to Kansas City. Teresa had spent years hustling for her education and job training in Wichita, but ended up being a farmer's wife. So she wanted Smarsh to be known for her talent and do the things she couldn't do. Smarsh felt the frustration of the lacking opportunities in rural life. Her best bet for relieving the frustration was school, which wasn't always a hospitable place for a poor child. In school, Smarsh faced difficulties but loved it for the learning, activities, and opportunity to be around other kids. Her parents were often absent from functions due to work or not understanding their significance in her life. They didn't ask if Smarsh did her homework and she had no idea that a parent was expected to be involved. However, she thrived in school, whether someone was rooting for her or not. Smarsh loved the quiet pleasure of living close to nature, but was developing the same tension that so many rural people carried, a feeling of containment and a desire to rip free. To resolve her childhood tensions about country and city, Smarsh craved the opportunity and unobstructed freedom that cities contained and pursued them. Chapter 5. The relationship between the city and the country has mutual benefits. City and country are a dichotomy that predates the United States by centuries. Like all industrialized states, America started as a country and turned into a city. There is a disparity between the country people and those who live in cities. City dwellers think farms no longer exist and see country people as less fortunate. They sometimes apply negative connotations and derogatory terms to them. Somewhere along the way, people moved from farms to cities until the nation was a more urban place than a rural one. Old farmers died and their kids sold everything off. Many of them had already moved to cities, which their parents often encouraged for their survival. A talented person from the country would endeavor to get out. Some got scholarships to college, flew town, and never looked back. Though the country's way of life was gradually dying, farmers still produced the food and other materials shipped worldwide. Living in rural areas and feeding strangers was their sole sense of connection to places they had never been. To devalue the people who tend crops and livestock is to forget not just a country's foundation, but its connection to the earth, to cycles of life, scarcely witnessed and ill-understood in concrete landscapes. The United States developed the notion that a dividing line of class and geography separates two essentially different people. Smarsh felt it was wrong, and the line was about a difference of experience, not humanity. To Smarsh, country was not a look, a style, or even a conscious attitude, but a physical place, its experience defined by the distance from the forces of culture that would commodify it. Chapter 6. Being poor and white is the worst kind of failure in America. Shame, psychologists say, developed as an evolutionary function to curb individual bad behavior that could harm the group. But society shames people for being in need of economic help. Rich whites think poor whites' failure reflects badly on the whole race, so poor whites are made invisible. To be made invisible as a class is an invalidation, which comes with a deep shame that makes you feel like a failure. America's contempt toward the poor can be seen in its approach to welfare programs. Bill Clinton ushered in an era of welfare reform where the dispersal of funds was turned over to the state governments. Some states chose to spend the money on workshops to promote family values that would cure poverty. In 1994, California created a costly electronic fingerprinting system for welfare recipients. The number of people on welfare reduced drastically for the next two decades. There is a misconception in society that applying for welfare is shameful and someone in a bad financial situation must be evil, lazy, or stupid. Being poor doesn't make you worthless. Class divide only makes life miserable for people by making them focus only on their failures. Smarsh grew up believing she shouldn't ask for help. She developed the habit of shoplifting when she was nine years old. To most people, she seemed like a well-behaved, straight-A student in school, but she kept her rebellion a secret. The things she stole mostly were things she wanted but couldn't afford. Having been taught in church and everywhere else, she knew stealing was wrong, but felt that the money system was unfair. She didn't think the world owed her anything, but it also didn't seem the world wouldn't give her anything that she didn't reach out and grab for herself. Doing so was a mark of moral failure and something that could ruin her life if she got caught. Smarsh never got caught, but was seen as smart by her school teachers instead. She won a speech contest which made her family very proud of her, hugging, laughing, and taking pictures with her when she left the stage. She realized that they suffered from weakness of character, just like everyone else, but could love deeply in their better moments. She concluded that what really puts the shame on people isn't their moral deficit, but their money deficit. Chapter 7. Home is not just about a shelter, but about security, stability, and safety. Smarsh learned renovation skills from her parents. Her dad was a carpenter, and her mom was a realtor who helped people find affordable homes, achieve home ownership, and negotiate mortgage tricks for low-income Wichitans. They had talents about houses and moved in and out of places, trailers, bad apartments, houses full of broken appliances. Sometimes they were able to make a beautiful home out of something cheap. They valued houses for more than just the shelter they could provide, but for the stability, safety, structure, and security. Jeannie didn't purchase more houses than she could afford. She figured life was too short and no house was truly secure. The body is the only permanent home. 
For most Americans, houses depict success and ownership as a source of economic pride. Many people work very hard to buy a house. Jeannie, Jeannie understood that buying a house wasn't always easy, so she didn't get attached to a place in case she had to move again. Her transient attitude resulted from her family, who moved from place to place in search of better lives. For the women in her family and their daughters, their constant moving was about staying safe from violent men and looking for new ways to pay the bills. Jeannie's mother Betty left several marriages and frequently moved, which affected Jeannie in several ways. She went to four different kindergartens. Children who move around a lot lack a sense of belonging. Smarsh eventually left home to live with her grandparents, who were different from the norm in her community, but she grew up to value security over the structures. Chapter 8 Poor women become powerful because of the wisdom they gain from their struggles. In poor and rural communities, women do not conform to gender roles because traditional expectations are not placed on them. Everyone is expected to work hard regardless of their gender. Smarsh grew up around women who had been running their own families and had ownership of finances. In 1912, Kansas became the eighth state and first in its region to give women the right to vote in all elections. Later on, women gained the right to own property and have custody of children equal to that of the father's right. While it was a huge step forward for gender equality, poor working-class women were always too busy trying to survive, so they didn't benefit from feminism. Even though women are being liberated, the poor ones still mostly depend on men. Women who can't afford to leave because of domestic violence stand the chance of being killed as a result of the violence. Smarsh's grandmother, Betty, was abused in a marriage, but she was still given the legal advice that she needed a spouse to gain custody of her son. Despite leaving many bad relationships, Betty never truly became independent. She got a position to work for the state as a secretary, which changed her financial status. She tried to get her son back again, but the court sided with her ex-husband, and she never got him back. Even though she worked hard to get a steady job, she had a history with men who provided for her and her children. She had no economic power, which is also social power. Smarsh believes that the experiences of the women in her family forced them into profound awareness, and she inherited old wisdom from them. They were powerful because they could bear the pain of their experiences without numbing themselves. Smarsh got scholarships to go to college, which surprised everyone who knew about her upbringing. She became financially stable after she left the farm behind. She also believed America had failed its people, but hoped for a better future. The greatest fortune of her life was getting out of a sense of lack and not internalizing poverty. Did you know? In 1923, the Equal Rights Amendment, an amendment to the U.S. Constitution, prohibiting discrimination based on sex, was introduced in Congress. Conclusion Looking at her family, Sarah Smarsh had the choice of either working hard to build her own financial foundation or living a carefree life, leading to becoming a young mother and an unpaid worker. Always striving to do the right thing was a boost towards her goal in life. Even though she moved away from her family to have a different life, she still lives close to them in the same area. Her experiences with her family have shaped her perspective as an upper-class citizen living among lower-class people. Her life has been a bridge between two places, the working poor and the higher economic classes the city, and the country, a conservative upbringing, and liberal adulthood. People are not always responsible for their successes or failures. While there are people who work hard for their money, there are some who are born into rich families. If you are born into a poor family, you may remain poor regardless of how hard you work. Economic inequality is one cultural divide that causes us to see one another as stereotypes, some of which allow the powerful to make harmful decisions in policy and politics. That separation is experienced as distances we might not realize are related to class. Every day, you would decide whether to stay, go, or try to go, and if you went, no matter where you ended up, like every immigrant, you'd still feel the invisible dirt of your motherland on the soles of your feet. Sarah Smarsh. Try this. Consider your past experiences. Let them be a push to thrive and excel. Regardless of your economic background and the economic divide in your country, make a decision to defy the odds by setting goals and taking practical steps to achieve financial stability and freedom. You can do this by reducing your impulse spendings, paying bills immediately, and most importantly, having a will to attain financial freedom.